One of the good things about these sessions is the range of talks that you get. Um, but it's kind of funny going third because I'm sitting watching two really wonderful talks thinking maybe I should shift it a bit. Um, but I'll keep with what I plan. Um, I'm going to take this slightly differently, um, and it's no criticism of anybody else who's talking today, but I just wanted to add another layer to this uh, whole discussion about where we're going in the future. And um, it'll take me a minute or two to get into this, because I want to present you with some quite complicated ideas very quickly, and then I'm going to show you a bit of my own work. Uh, I would stress this is not as a worked example of what I'm preaching. This is simply my fumbling attempts to do what I believe in. Uh, so I think the main thing here is to at least attempt it rather than achieve it. So what you're looking at here is a still from Andre Tarkovsky's 1982 film, Nostalgia. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I would recommend it. Um, nostalgia is about lots of things, but it's actually about madness. And one of the main, main characters is a madman in an Italian village uh, called Volterra. Um, this is a Russian translator who is in Italy, um, dreaming of his homeland of Russia. Uh, Tarkovsky was exiled from Russia because of his filmmaking and had to leave the country uh, before he made nostalgia. Here you see the Russian translator uh, dreaming of his little wooden house of his childhood set within the ruins of a great Gothic cathedral. And I just remind you that the great Gothic cathedrals were probably the last time in human history when there was a kind of collective will to build something which represented beyond uh, our everyday existence. Um, but the main point about this film is that the madman at some point when the translator meets him and is discussing his insanity, um, he just says, look what the sane have done to the world. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the translator is confronted with this reality. Look what the saying have actually done to the world. So, on a lighter note, the other film it referenced, because this is the, a way I thought maybe I could get this thought across, is um, Jacques Tati's 1958 movie, Mon Uncle. Again, if you haven't seen it, I'd recommend it. Uh, in synoptic, uh, Jacques Tati as the uncle, Mr. Hulot. Uh, you can just see him, um, just in the window up there. Um, lives in this rambling apartment block, but Jacques Tati actually modified this building in order to make it kind of chaotic. And one of the gags in the film is he has to walk entirely around it about three times in order to get this into apartment, which is up here. And uh, he locks his door every time he goes out and hangs the key above the door in full view of the entire square beneath him. <laughs> uh, and it's Paris, late 1950s, markets, people talking in the street, interaction, nobody locks their doors. And it's counterpointed with his sister, who has married a wealthy businessman called Apple, who lives in this extremely modernist house, which is a kind of first form of gated community. This gate only opens on an electric lock which she operates from inside the kitchen. And if it's someone important, the ornamental fountain, the fish, spouts water. And if it's just the tradesman, it doesn't. Um, and this is the kind of beginning of the problem, if you like, uh, that we face, which is that the architecture supports isolation and it supports it through consumerism and reducing us all to little more than simply shoppers. So I've always wanted to do a, a short lecture where I show this building next to Jacques Tati's Mon Oncle. So this, if you don't know it, is uh, a building by a, an Austrian philosopher called Rudolf Steiner. Uh, it was built in 1926. Uh, Steiner designed it as a plus in model and then uh, unfortunately died, so it was built later. Um, but it's one of the world's first uses of concrete in a sculptural expressive fashion. And I only show it because this particular man has been quite an influence on my life, and I don't mind, uh, uh, you know, you're kind of a select group here, uh, sharing that. Um, and I'll explain why in a second. You could do whole lectures on this building, I haven't got the time to do it, but I suggest you look it up. It's called the Goethe Arnhem, which is like Goethe, as in um, the German scientist and writer of Faust. Um, two verses of this building, this is the second one. 
The point is, it's Steiner in many lectures that he wrote at this time, remember this was just after the First World War, um, made the point that architecture is a socially cohesive art and that architecture is fundamentally important to human evolution. Um, buildings that we create uh, not just are a legacy for the future, but they actually help us in our own developmental processes, both as individuals and as a society. And if you compare this, which I would say is the nearest you get to a modern Gothic cathedral, to what we're doing at the moment, uh, when we think of past civilizations, we think about great monuments to, uh, if you like, kind of spiritual values, let's use that word. Um, what will future generations think of us? What, what were our main constructions in the 21st century? Monuments to corporate capitalism, perhaps? Where are the great cathedrals um, of the past? Uh, this architect is called Abby Asmussen, and uh, he uh, died about 10 years ago, and working in Sweden, and he's my kind of model for how you do socially aware architecture. Um, this is the House of Culture at Jena, south of Stockholm. Um, he's actually a Danish architect, and he spent most of his time working on this site. He did over 20 buildings. Um, very cohesive social process, backed by a philosophy, integrated into the landscape. This was the final building he did, which is very much modelled on Steiner's idea, but importantly, not a replica. He took this and uh, took on this, if you like, the Swedish uh, indigenous national style way, use of materials and then integrated it into a philosophy. Uh, Steiner's views on architecture are not a recipe. They're simply a, a kind of a philosophical underlay that you can apply to a design process. I've got a clock watch here a bit. Okay, so I'm going to show a few of the schemes I've worked on and um, uh, several of them are chapels. And they are for an organization called the Chris Community, which is kind of something which came out of the Steiner movement. I should stress here that I'm not religious. I have no religion. Uh, <laughs> so I, you know, my destiny was to end up doing chapels for the Chris Community, I don't know. But I do, um, I do support their beliefs in the sense I, I think they perform a very important function. Any organization which involves itself in ritual uh, it seems to me to be incredibly important now. And I, I'm kind of supported in this by my absolute belief that the, the universe and the world that we see around us is imbued with a divine consciousness. It's obvious that this is not an accident, what we live in. So that's what kind of drives it. So these projects started very humbly with a little church I did in Canterbury. And these are some initial drawings of it. And the interesting brief for the Chris community is, um, they said, can, we, can you do us a building which has no historical references? So when you look at it, you do not associate it with any particular faith. <laughs> which is kind of a challenge for an architect, because we love historical precedents. Um, so I started working with these much softer forms, which obviously come out of Steiner's view that buildings, in a way, replicate what you see as the forces which generate natural forms in the world. And you can see I'm working with basically plans and sections here. Somebody pointed out they are kind of heart-shaped, but I only realized that after I'd drawn, drawn them, in fact. So as, as Ben pointed out, I mean, I do the same thing. I always make models. Um, and I have a slightly different line with this because I'm, a, I'm an architect. I was trained conventionally. And I have to work within a conventional construction industry. So the big challenge is, how do you make these shapes within a construction industry which normally only likes straight lines and produces everything flat? So I work with a really clever engineer called David Tasker. And this little building uses things called zip panels, which are basically ply panels with insulation on to form the main roofs. So that's the chapel. Can't make that work. It's not working. That's the chapel, that's the social space, and these are the kind of intermediate service spaces, and this is a foyer. It's a very small building. Um, and I will show a few plans, because they're kind of, if you're architects amongst you, I'm not sure how many architects are out there, you might want to see the odd plan. Um, Chris Community is very keen that they do the traditional 
chapel which faces east, the altar faces east, which is why this space is oriented on this funny angle. So this is not just me being perverse, it's actually getting it facing east because the, the altar's here. Um, and of course it generates lots of difficulties in terms of construction. So the challenge is, you know, how do you how do you make the thing come out without being too forced? It has a kind of natural form which grows out of the program. Um, and you can see quite, I mean, I didn't want to turn this into a technical lecture, but basically it's built of timber, the entire thing is built of timber. And uh, this is actually using eye sections around here on the um, walls. And then the zip panels are actually the, uh, the roof, which is then uh, put on afterwards. And I'll show you one construction photograph. Because of the complexity of this shape, most of this was made off site. It was actually made in Lincolnshire by Cowley Structural Timber Works, which is my kind of compromise because they sort of handcraft it, but then it's delivered. And it, it's just my problem with the English construction industry or British one, which is that basically I can't find people that can make this kind of thing on site because it, the, the skill base in this country generally is too low with ordinary contractors. So there you see it being put up. That's the social space. Um, you can just see the panels here, which have been come in sections. They come on a lorry and they're lifted in. And this funny white thing around here is actually me drawing on the concrete footing. So I draw the shape of it <laughs> on the ground so they know where to put the panels. Um, like most architects, I'm a bit of a control freak, so I didn't trust them to set it out. Uh, it's kind of interesting that because apparently Greek temples and Gothic cathedrals were set out in exactly the same way. They drew the plan on the ground and then built up from that. Um, it uses wood fibre insulation and basically as natural materials as I can possibly get my hands on, uh, apart from the slab which it sits on, which is a raft of concrete. This is an archaeological site just outside Canterbury, so we weren't allowed to go more than 300 millimetres deep on the dig, so we had to float the whole building. That's the inside space. Sorry, the slide's a bit dark. So um, you can see it's got quite a lot of movement. Um, and this is before the altar was installed. Uh, this particular priest wouldn't allow us to take a photograph of the altar installed because the space is then consecrated. Um, so it's, it, it looks rather different with an altar. And it was a specially designed altar in black slate to match the floor. It's Welsh black slate. It's very austere. Um, the colour is prescribed by them. I didn't choose it, although Brent kind of like it. Um, but you can see that basically everything has to be, in a sense, handcrafted, but using hand tools which are machine driven. So the doors, for example, were made in a workshop down the road and they've got specially designed uh, integral handles. I didn't buy any door handles for this project, for example. Um, all the windows are specially made because they're not square. And these forms really come out of Steiner's ideas of, in a sense, replicating an inner movement in you, which is the same sort of thing you get when you look at something like a tree or something which is um, rowing. Whether that does it for you, I don't know. It's hard to photograph, but the best thing to do is to see these buildings and see if you have the same reaction. And that's it peeping above a little wall which sits in front of it. It's on a very busy street in Canterbury, which is um, quite, a, well, parts of it are quite a deprived area. So um, this wall was actually demanded to be left by the conservation people, but I actually quite like the fact that it's slightly hidden and sort of looks over the top. So the bigger project that came out of this was uh, in London, which is a project in Hammersmith. This is within 100 metres of the uh, Hammersmith flyover. It's the second most polluted place in London. I can't remember what the first most, most polluted place is. But, um, and it's also under the... Somebody know? Oxford. Yeah, Oxford Street, that's right. It's right under the flight path of Heathrow. So you get jumbo jets coming in with their undercarriage down. So the first thing was that um, it's a problem for noise. Uh, it's also a listed building. I don't know if you can really see this, but there's a sort of garden wall. The bit on the right... Is, the, is an old um, studio owned by Frank Brownwin, the uh, <coughs> 20th century painter. And there's a courtyard in here, and behind that is an 1800 house listed grade two. So we kept all that, and the, the, the idea was to remodel the front of this um, and build a new chapel where that 
redundant space was. So we kept most of the building and built a new chapel. And the entire chapel was built in CLT, which is cross-laminate timber, fabricated off-site in order to get the complex geometry right um, without having to build it in situ. So that's what it looked like before we got involved in this. And I'm cutting this very short, this story. And that's what it looks like afterwards. So you can see we've taken the shop off the front, remodeled that bit by overcladding it, and everything from there onwards is new CLT building. And this is a new foyer CLT building. Great thing about CLT is you can get these shapes, and if you set the geometry up right, you can do quite dramatic things with it, which is very difficult in things like traditional masonry. And you can even do walls which aren't vertical. That's the, um, the front entrance porch. This is a very narrow pavement, so we kind of gave away quite a lot of the pavement to create a new sort of outer courtyard. Here, well, this is the door to the chapel. I'm getting a very distorted view of this here, but this only came when you were I wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, everything in here is sort of bespoke, the windows, the doors, um, all the detailing. It has no conventional gutters. They're all built in, et cetera, et cetera, including the sort of water chute where everything ends up down here, um, which is very time consuming, but an incredibly interesting process working with priests and congregations. And I'll go into this a little bit more on the next project, how we do that. I just want to show you this one quickly. That's, not, uh, that's a plan of it. So just for architects, basically, this is the existing building all around here. That's the old house. This is the outer courtyard here. Sorry, that's the outer courtyard. This is the inner courtyard, the entrance to the old house, which is actually a hotel. This is a restaurant at first floor. We've got its own entrance here, and this is a new chapel. So we're trying to resolve the geometries between this space, which is a Peabody estate, and the existing house with some sort of symmetrical axial space. Um, we had a party wall here, which we couldn't have windows in, and a wall here, which went up against the restaurant, the vegetarian restaurant. So we couldn't have any windows in the side of this chapel. So everything ha hangs on the section where the light comes in from the top and drops down behind these new columns which hold up the inner roof. It's got two inner and outer roofs in order to reduce the noise from the jets going overhead. And it's got a massive, uh, a passive stack effect ventilation system with air drawn from the garden. Can't draw it from the street, it's too dirty. <laughs> so the chapel space ends up looking like that. So these, this is entirely timber construction in here. This is CLT, just uh, with a natural colour on it, and this is uh, glue lamb beams which are shaped uh, with little steel brackets, so the light popping down the back of them. One of the things about these Christian chapels is we're very keen to reduce all the sort of modern technology that you get in ordinary rooms. Look at it in this one, it's everywhere. Um, so you can't see any light fittings, they're all tucked behind the columns in grooves, you can't see any power points. The only thing I didn't get away with, if you've got good eyesight, is the, is the fired smoke detector. Couldn't hide that one. It's the only thing you see in the entire space. That's the uh, back of the chapel. You can just see the columns there. And uh, where the roof gets lower, we've got top lights to, to illuminate it. So, in fact, the chapel gets darker towards the altar because they have candles. So you, the, the, the candles become the main focus of the light. And if you have eyesight problems, you would be encouraged to sit at the back where there's more natural light. How am I doing? I'm all right. Okay. Um, this is quite an interesting drawing. This is, uh, this is the CLT drawing. I quite like thinking of buildings like dressmaking. So this is, the, this is all the CLT panels <laughs> drawn flat. Um, so you can just see that's the roof. That's the sloped bit at the front. This is the front wall you saw in the front illustration. There's the plan of it there. So if you fold them all out, that's what they look like. And this is how we work it out. We use 3D modelling, but I also quite like these drawings because they kind of become things in themselves. And that's the garden. Just briefly, we worked with a, an artist called Gertrude Goodwin. Um, these four gates were all designed by her, made in black plasticine at 1 to 10 scale. Then we blew them up on photocopiers on paper. We got a joiner to cut the templates in hardboard. And then we got a, a welder um, to hand cut them um, because we didn't want laser cuts. And I, I told him to go down the pub before he did it so the line was nice and wobbly. <laughs> Um, but he didn't do that, he did it. But anyway, it's a shaky line, so it's kind of, and there are, there are kind of sequence of, this is the archetype, and then it gets more and more complicated, and you can see it's based on a Celtic cross motif. Very nice working with artists on buildings. 
Okay, so this is Stroud. Um, this is, hasn't been built yet. This is one that, um, it's another Christian community chapel. This is one where I just very briefly, in a couple of minutes, go through the sort of process we go through normally, but this is better documented. This is with the congregation uh, initially asked them to vision their buildings. These are not architects, so vision their buildings. So you can see the incredible range here of shapes that they're coming out with. That's completely flat, that's very formed, and I've put them in a sort of order. This is, you know, there are as many people in this workshop as there are pieces of plasticine. Uh, so you kind of think, well, what do I do with that? You know, so by a very long process, which involves other exercises, like I, I drew the existing church they've got, which is going to be uh, unfortunately demolished, I have to say that, Duncan. Um, and we did a little plan and we said, well, like, can you just draw a map of what you do when you walk in the building normally? So these are little maps. It's quite interesting, actually, because most of them don't go straight into the chapel. They sort of hang around, talk. So the incidental spaces are as, as important as the, as the chapel space. So that was very helpful. So again, to cut a very long, complicated story very short, they just we did about 10 workshops for this building. And then we made a series of models. That was the first one, top-down view of it. It's basically made of plasticine, uh, so we can fiddle around with it. But the top roof we already decided we were going to do a really geometric CLT structure, pure CLT, flat sheet timber. Um, and then we made, a, uh, we made a plan of it, which is this one here. So that's the chapel, this is the entrance, that's the social space, that's the caretaker's house. There's the sections through it. It's on a split level site, but effectively I'm just trying to give you a sense of what it's about. But a better way of understanding it is the next model which is, this is the CLT, this is an entire CLT structure, the whole of this. So we can get these very highly modelled geometric forms just using the timber. Um, other visualisation exercises we have to do with the congregation because they they got quite interested in detail. Um, so we do little perspectives of it. You know, it's kind of interesting. Five minutes, okay. It's kind of interesting working with Chris and Michi, because although they are aware of the kind of philosophy that Steiner was promoting, uh, these windows cause more trouble than anything else. Uh, they didn't like, you know, slopey head windows that sit on corners. Anyway, loads of discussions about it. Um, but uh, I listened, and then uh, I have to admit, between you and me, I ignored them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's at some point is an architect where you think, look, come on, I've been doing this for years. I do know best. Sorry. So, that, but I mean, <laughs> it's a serious point. At some point in this process, you cannot design buildings by committee. A social process means you listen and you take it on board. But ultimately, somebody has to say, okay, this is what we're going to do. It's actually what happened with the second good Yana. That's what Steiner did. This is what we're going to do, or else it won't happen. That's a digital image of what the inside looks like. Uh, quickly, Tobias, bit of housing. Uh, this is a building by Abby Asmussen, very first one in England, the only one in England, apart from the art college, which is just over the way. I won't show a picture of that. Little children's hostel, which we um, turned into flats. We overclad it, rendered it, and changed the roof, and turned it into flats. And it's kind of, it's kind of a version of social housing, although it is for sale. I'll explain that very briefly. So that's what it looked like. That's now what it looks like. So it's got 130 millimetres overclad insulation, rendered new roof, flip ups at the end in order to make uh, nine flats. But the middle rooms are the nice ones, so we set, kept those as a social space, which everybody co-owns when they buy into this scheme. It's also got a biomass... Sorry, how do I go back? It's got a biomass boiler over here, which is going to feed a new row of houses to the left. And that's... oh. That's the, social, that's the social space in the middle. There, that's the wrong button, isn't it? That's the social space which everybody uses for parties or uh, events, etc., etc. Biomass boiler also feeds the heat to the art college, so they get cheap energy. Uh, we gave people options on the plans, the back-to-back -back units in the middle, so you can see they're getting variations of how you split the rooms up before they buy them. Very crude drawings, but they just simply so we can change them quickly if somebody changes their mind. Uh, that's a model of the site. So the building I'm talking about is here. This is the biomass boiler, and this is the new row of houses, which we're just about to build now. We haven't started building them yet. Uh, starting, starting this month. Uh, that's a model of it. So it's modelled on the original building. It has these kind of same forms, gestures here. 
This is built about porotherm blocks, which I'm getting into, clay blocks with wood fibre insulation and render on the outside. And finally, one minute. Um, I was asked to do this building recently. I don't tend to do big buildings, so I ummed and ahed a lot. But this is, uh, I got kind of drawn into it because I felt it was important work that uh, this this institution was doing there, the one, they're about the only um, centre now for severely brain damaged people uh, in Kent, and it's over near Hildenborough. And uh, just very briefly, the idea is that it's 24 bedrooms, that they all, uh, it sits in a forest basically of, of rather big pine trees. And the idea was, I thought, well, if you're brain damaged and you can't move for six months, um, what, do you, what do you wanna do, you know? So if you can sense anything, I thought the best thing would be to look at the trees. So every single room is on the ground floor looking at the trees. And then on the section, I buried the treatment rooms down in here with a big courtyard in the middle. So it's, so it's a sort of private space in here. So that's the cross section. That's a bedroom. And I'm very interested in the light that you would then have to deal with in here. So it's got top light and the view and it gets the section of the ceiling, so you don't, you're not in a horizontal plane. And it was interesting because the conservation officer that we met about this, who supported it, said that he'd had a stroke 10 years before and was incapacitated for four months. And the worst thing about it was he said, I was in a terrible room and I couldn't move. <laughs> and that's the model of it. Um, we've got 30 seconds for a quote. 30 seconds, yeah. Okay. If you haven't read it, I recommend a book by William Offals called um, Immoderate Greatness. It's about the history of all civilizations in a very small package. There's been no civilization in the history of this world which has lasted more than a thousand years. Depending on when you think, if this is a civilization, when ours started, we're pretty near the end. And the final phase of all civilizations is decadence. And decadence, he says, uh, marked by four things. Denial that, it's, denial that the end of the civilization is coming multiple distractions, obsession with perverse sex, interesting. Uh, the Americans spend more money on sex toys than they do on foreign aid. Uh, and the concentration of power and money. Now we tick all those boxes, every single one of them. Um, so we can't go on living like this. We have to change the way we think about the world. We have to understand how the world works. This has come up twice before today. And we have to join some kind of alternative movement which has got a consciousness state which will solve this problem. So I know you're all converted, so I don't need to tell you this, but I thought I'd give you one last quote, which was quoted by Anne-Marie Williamson, who actually wrote the quote that Nelson Mandela gave when he came out of prison. You are a child of God, that one. Uh, but it's quoted from Dante, the Divine Comedy. So if you ever get stuck in a conversation about how there's no problem, how global warming is not happening, etc., etc., I suggest you throw this at somebody. It goes, the hottest place in hell is reserved for those who, in times of crisis, prefer to remain neutral. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>